This video is going to be about artificial intelligence, research being done, and how to get into this field for those who are looking into what to study in college. Now what is artificial intelligence? The definition is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. Artificial intelligence is a wide field. You probably have something specific you're imagining right now, but let's go over just briefly some applications before going into more depth. The first is self-driving cars. This is all over the news and as you probably know we are trying to make cars that are fully autonomous using sensors, cameras, radar, and various software so that cars do not need a human behind the wheel. Elon Musk even predicts that in a few decades cars won't even have steering wheels because they will all be fully autonomous. Artificial intelligence is being used in finance to make trading decisions at high speeds. Or in personal finance as an example, there's an app called Digit out there that uses artificial intelligence to analyze income, current balance, and spending habits, and then makes decisions on when to transfer money to your savings and how much to transfer so it makes saving money as effortless as possible. AI is being used to play games like chess where the goal is to make a computer that can beat the best humans out there, which I will talk about later. It's being used for language translation, such as Google Translate, or on YouTube to generate subtitles simply based on audio. It's being used for publishing. For example, the company Echobox is creating software to increase traffic for publishers by analyzing how certain people respond and interact with different articles, and then strategically posting content on various platforms like Facebook or Twitter. It can analyze headlines that best serve your audience, look up hashtags that would be the best to use, and more. AI is big in hospitals and medicine, and research is being done to help with the interpretation of medical images, like with detecting a tumor, in drug creation, creating proper treatment plans, and so on. It's used for email spam filtering, the government uses facial recognition for defense purposes, AI is being used for facial expression recognition to read for emotion, and so much more. Now before I get into more specifics, let's go over how to get into this sector of artificial intelligence and how you should tailor your education. Now in terms of undergrad, you won't really see artificial intelligence as a major. You don't start there. The best major to go into, just in general, is computer science. That is probably the best starting point and I'll explain why soon, but remember AI is a broad field. Other majors that are good to begin with as well would be math, statistics, electrical engineering, software engineering, or even computer engineering, which are in no particular order. But for artificial intelligence, you really want to consider getting a master's and even a PhD because a lot of artificial intelligence is research-based, which needs further education. And actually, that's where it's more important to take classes and do projects related to AI. Your undergrad degree, although lays a good foundation, isn't the most important. Now take the company DeepMind. This is an artificial intelligence company owned by Google that I will talk about soon because they did something really big recently. But on their careers page, I found three research positions. The requirements for the three positions are as follows. So as you can see, computer science comes up every single time. So does machine learning, but that's something you'd pursue after a bachelor's as well. Then two out of three required a PhD because they are research positions. And no, it does say or equivalent on top of these, so it's not like you have to have studied these, but this should just give you an idea of where you should begin. I know this is just one company, but I went to other AI company websites and I saw job postings where the requirements were like computer science or equivalent, or one had computer science, electrical engineering, robotics or equivalent. So as you can see, computer science is definitely not a requirement, but you can also probably see why I emphasized it the most. And again, AI is very broad. If you want to go into robotics, let's say, then there will be moving parts and lots of hardware, like maybe with autonomous cars and then electrical or computer engineering might be a good route. But with Google Translate, which is also AI, that's a different story because computer scientists are probably working more on that. Computer scientists or maybe mathematicians do more of the algorithm design and mathematical modeling for these systems. While it's possible for a computer or electrical engineer to get into this, they might be doing more of the hardware design. So as always, it's not so black and white as to who can do what, but you should take note of these differences. But now let's dive a little more into artificial intelligence because it gets really interesting. First, artificial intelligence can be broken up into many branches. There's machine learning, natural language processing, like translating a language. There's vision, like image recognition, speech recognition, like speech to text or text to speech, robotics, and more. 
Machine learning is the big one, which I'm going to talk about. And I'm sure you've heard of this term before. But realize that machine learning isn't the same as artificial intelligence, but it is related and has shown some of the most promising innovations so far. Now what is machine learning? Well, it's basically about writing software that can learn from past experiences. And by experience, that really means data. If this is new to you, it's a bigger deal than you may think. When you play a game of Super Smash Brothers, you may have played against the computer. Now did the computer get better over time? No, it did not. You play a level 9 computer a million times and it's just as good as it was to begin. Because it doesn't use machine learning. The computer was programmed to be as good as it was. Now if it did use machine learning, the computer might start off really bad, but it would learn and get better as it played and made connections, just like you started off bad but got better. But a computer could get to superhuman levels as it kept playing and playing. At least assuming the learning algorithm was designed well. That's the power of machine learning. But let's go simpler. For example, take these two pictures. It's very easy for us to tell which one is a dog and which is a cat. But for a computer, it's much more difficult. Without machine learning, how can you tell a computer to tell the difference? Well, you have to program it and tell it what to look for. You could tell the computer to look for facial features and program into it what a dog's face versus a cat's face looks like. You could tell it what a cat's tail versus a dog's tail looks like. You could tell it that cat's ears are pointy while dog's ears aren't so much and tell it to look for all of this. You have to program everything into it. Then the program can hopefully distinguish between the two if you showed it a picture. But that's a lot and this gets even more hectic for more complicated objects. But here's how machine learning does it in a nutshell. With machine learning, you have your program, which isn't given any features of dogs or cats or anything like that. Then you give it a bunch of pictures of dogs and you tell the program, these are dogs. Now learn what you need in order to recognize one. It looks for patterns and consistencies and figures out how to know what a dog is. And the same would go for cats. It works backwards. At first, the program is terrible. It's not pre-programmed to look for anything. And with just one or two pictures, the program has only so much to go off of. But show the program a thousand or a hundred thousand photos, and it will be able to connect the dots more and more until you have a very strong program to determine the difference. But how does it do this? Well, I'm going to simplify this a lot, and this next part will be as technical as I get in this video. Let's say you want to make a program that predicts your test score from the amount of hours you studied and how much sleep you got. Now, if you wanted to just hard code this, maybe you could come up with some equation, kind of like a best fit line from previous data you have, or maybe a best fit curve, and that would do a pretty good job. But that's not learning because you gave the program the prediction equation. So how can we make a program that learns? Well, you have your inputs, and in our case, it would be just two hours of studying and hours of sleep. And then there's the output, in our case it would just be the test score. Then in between those are the hidden layers. Hidden layers can have a few layers, or they can be really big. These deep layers are where the term deep learning comes from. And by the way, this is also a neural network, where what you're seeing is kind of made up like the human brain, where the circles you see are the neurons, and all these connections are the synapses that connect them. And there are other ways to do machine learning besides neural networks, but these are becoming more and more popular and are proving to be the most helpful. But going back, for simplicity, let's say there are just two neurons in the hidden layer. Then those are each connected to both the inputs. Now each connection in this system has a certain number or weight associated with it. So now if we have some inputs, like we studied for 8 hours in total and slept for 7 hours the night before. Well, you just multiply those by the weights and add them at the neurons. So those weights mean like one parameter carries more weight or is a better predictor of the outcome than the other. And this continues until the end and it will spit out your predicted test score, or in our case 64.5. Now the way I explained it is wrong. There is more to it. There's something called an activation function, for example. So you see that 26.5, which I got from multiplying the inputs by the weights, which is all good. But then you have to apply some function to that number or plug it in for X and get another value. Then you have to do some manipulation with those before reaching the output. And also scaling is important because at least in our case, our output has to be between 0 and 100. 
So yes, there's more to it, but for now it's nothing to worry about because we're just trying to understand the basics. At least for now, realize that you have to use weights and multiply the inputs by those weights as you propagate to the output. But now the question is where did those weights come from and how do we know those will lead us to the right prediction? Well at first those weights are just random and they probably give horribly wrong answers. Maybe you got a 92 on that exam, not even close to a 64.5. But here's where the learning comes in. You give the program that output and say hey I got a 92 not a 64.5 just like we saw before where you show the pictures of dogs and say this is a dog. So then the program back propagates through the layers and changes those weights by a little bit to reduce the error. It learned that it's wrong and is fixing itself. But even if those weights work for this set of inputs, they might not work for the next. So you have to keep giving it real inputs and outputs so it knows how wrong it is. And this is called training. You're making the program smarter. It will keep back propagating and fixing the weights after you've shown it dozens, then hundreds, and thousands of different pieces of data. The program will then become more and more accurate. This was also an example of supervised learning because we were giving it inputs and the outputs associated with those. But there's more including unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So of course we didn't even scratch the surface, but hopefully you now have a basic idea of how machine learning works. And by the way, you see how this only has a few parameters? As a random example, Facebook has a facial recognition program that uses a deep network, which has 120 million parameters. Not exactly the same technique as here, but yes, it can get quite complicated. But that's as technical as I'm going to get, and I'll continue on in the part 2 video where I will cover applications of this machine learning, breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, as well as AI companies you may find interesting. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in part two.